So, I rewatched Black Panther with a friend of mine. It's got some problems. Black Panther has some really strong performances, great bits of character interactions, and an overall compelling theme to draw from. But with a lot of its strengths in mind, I think the writing itself has too many narrative-breaking problems that makes it really hard to follow overall. The plot doesn't make any sense as well as the world building, and the characters are frequently inconsistent. If you disagree with anything, and I imagine people will, you're free to come on Disagreement Day, which is hosted every week or so on the channel. A major issue in the world building is the way in which Wakanda chooses its leader. So Wakanda has a challenge day, where the king is decided through trial by combat, meaning that the strongest fighter, who could easily be really stupid or really evil is going to be the one ruling Wakanda. The go-to defense I've seen for this is that the movie is about challenging traditions and accepting changes to the system. Now, here's why that doesn't really work. In Captain America Civil War, T'Challa was already chosen as the Black Panther, while his older and less abled father is leading the country as their king. That means King T'Chaka himself acknowledges that while he isn't the best suited to fight, he's the best suited to lead. He himself understands the distinction, yet in the decades he spent as the king of Wakanda, he kept this law in place without any attempt to change this tradition. A tradition based in ideas that he himself doesn't believe in or follow. There's zero consistency in that decision. Furthermore, allowing this law to stick goes against his entire position on the Accords. King T'Chaka signed the Accords under the belief that the Avengers needed to practice restraint because of how powerful they are. He doesn't think the Avengers should be making these executive decisions without supervision, which means he believes that being the most powerful heroes in the world does not make them the most qualified decision makers. Yes, I'm glad we agree. So why does he run his nation? under the basis of maintaining tradition, which is the go-to defense people make for this. I understand that's the theme of the movie, but... When stolen Wakandan vibranium was used to make a terrible weapon, we in Wakanda were forced to question our legacy. Goodwill mission from a country too long in the shadows. We will fight to improve the world we wish to join. So this means that King T'Chaka himself, who was T'Challa's main inspiration, who was already challenging Wakandan traditions on the basis of the events of Age of Ultron, where their vibranium was stolen by Ultron, which nearly destroyed the entire world. He already believed they needed to step out of the shadows, question their legacy, and start improving the world with what they have to offer. Civil War very clearly set this up, but this movie dropped it. So the entire theme of this movie is pointless because they already would have been making changes to their system back in 20. 15, and the world building hinges on a massive character assassination of King T'Chaka. The premise of the story and its main messaging can't function already. But to elaborate on why trial by combat doesn't make sense, for some reason they schedule it as challenge day. Keyword day. So that means on that day, the king would have to face off numerous challengers and win all of the battles, even though he would largely be fatigued after round one compared to newer fighters. That doesn't even logically prove who's the better fighter, and considering King T'Chaka's age, did nobody think to challenge him through trial by combat? That's an easy win for any experienced warrior. How did King T'Chaka stay in office in recent years? Did he just deny all battle requests because he knows how stupid trial by combat is? Which is why he made no attempt to get rid of that election system? Did he have his son fight for him? Which reaffirms what I said about how even he understands that leadership skills and fighting skills are two separate things? This system doesn't even align with his morals because you're allowed to kill potential leaders. Victory at the expense of the innocent is no victory at all. An election candidate is an innocent person who wants what's best for the country, yet you're allowed to kill them in battle to become king? And apparently Killmonger is allowed to kill a bystander who steps in and still become king? Why does this system exist? Wakanda has survived for so long by fighting when only absolutely necessary. So it's Wakandan tradition to fight only when absolutely necessary, yet they still elect leaders through trial by combat where candidates can be killed. And furthermore, if that's what qualifies as Wakandan tradition, and they survive so long by avoiding fights if they can, that tells me that the early founders of Wakandan tradition were more diplomatic, which explains why they haven't taken over other neighboring territory, but only adds to the issue as to why trial by combat is even used. Already, the problems in the world building are destructive to T'Chaka as a character, and the overall basis for the story, but there are further issues that add to this. Wakanda was formed thousands of years ago, and they were the only nation that has ever acquired vibranium. They remained in isolation and decided 
decided to keep the truth behind their nation a secret by creating an illusion tech force field? Okay, so if some random bystander decided to walk up to that location, a location which Captain America Civil War showed was on the map, what happens? Do they get approached by security, which is really just a bunch of people with spears and horses? You would think, especially in the world of the MCU, that many people throughout history would be interested in Wakanda. You literally have videos of Wakanda on TV, so even the news tried to reach this location. They even talk about its geography as if they've explored the place fortified by mountain ranges and an impenetrable rainforest. Even ignoring exploration or land conquering purposes to explore Wakanda, if Wakanda is a struggling nation in the public eye, you'd think there'd be interested parties that would want to support those in need. So if you even walk to the barrier, you're either going to cross to the other side and see how technologically advanced it is, or you'll be stuck outside like it's some kind of force field, which would draw attention and suspicion regardless. And if Tony Stark or any of the other Avengers go to investigate Wakanda for themselves, good luck hiding the truth from them. And there's quite a few motivations the Avengers would have to visit Wakanda. First of all, Tony believed that his father had the last of the vibranium from a Wakandan trade deal, and the Avengers know this. The Avengers learned in Age of Ultron that this wasn't the case, and they know that vibranium Vibranium comes from Wakanda, which is supposedly a third world country. I thought your father said he got the last of it. I don't follow what comes out of Wakanda. The strongest metal on earth. Wakanda has access to the rarest and strongest metal on Earth. A greater supply than Tony was even aware of based on what his father had relayed decades ago. Which would be more than enough for Tony and the team to believe there's something hidden about Wakanda that would be interesting to investigate. Secondly, the Avengers know how dangerous Vibranium can be in the wrong hands. And there was literally a deal with Vibranium in Age of Ultron, which led to significant consequences. So the Avengers would want to look into where this sudden stream of Vibranium is coming coming from after all these decades, especially if it's being used to arm criminals. This isn't something that's below their pay grade, I don't care what Homecoming says. The Avengers would have learned the truth about Wakanda very quickly. What's Wakanda's plan if that does happen? Shouldn't they know about advanced technology that amps humans or just superhumans in general exist and therefore can bypass the barrier? Why does their security only amount to that illusion and guards with spears and horses? You'd think they'd want to tighten it up with the existence of superhumans. With how poor their security is, I'd argue that even Black Widow could probably break into Wakanda very easily. Did they bother setting up any defensive weapons or keeping their more advanced material underground? We know they have this large network of underground work with Vibranium, which is good for keeping things hidden, but if they wanted to continuously hide in plain sight, why not build their futuristic stuff underground? in the mountains, or even the water while they're under lock and key, and have less advanced stuff on the surface. They already do this to an extent with much of their architecture, likely for cultural reasons or having a preference for the aesthetic, yet they don't make use of any of their potential hiding places for their future tech. So. Stir showed me this in Iron Man 2. Apparently S.H.I.E.L.D. had information on Wakanda already, as it was an area of interest. And S.H.I.E.L.D. found nothing. Now that I've covered the world building, I'd like to run through the plot of the movie. While most of these will mention plot problems, I will mention issues I have with the characters too. For starters, this opening action sequences establishes that Black Panther has devices that can stop cars immediately. I don't know why this was never used in Civil War, where there was a literal car chase taking place. And it turns out Black Panther was ruining Nakia's mission in helping these people in the truck, which could work if he simply didn't know. But the reason he gave is that he wants Nakia to see him be crowned king. Why are you here? He should ruin my mission. My father is dead, Nakia. I will be crowned king tomorrow. I wish for you to be there. I don't know why he needed to ruin her mission to help these people to do that. And even after the soldiers are taken out, they just fly away and leave these hostages behind instead of ensuring their safety getting home. The vehicles are down, they're in the middle of nowhere, how do you expect them to get home in a safe and timely manner? These gunmen could have called for backup for all they know, and these people are left to be captured again. Later on, Killmonger goes to this museum to steal this weapon made out of Vibranium. Killmonger knows this, but not the Wakandans for some reason, despite them having full information on Vibranium that Killmonger wouldn't have found on his own. There is literally Vibranium laying around in America, and for some reason, they never cared to retrieve it. And the museum staff somehow didn't know that it was Vibranium, which they would know if they actually checked what it was made of. 
We also learn that Claw was brought on to carry out the heist, the guy who Wakanda has been searching for since the 90s. His history states that he was an assassin who was hired to take down King T'Chaka, but was locked up and branded by Wakanda. The Avengers tracked down Claw within a day of accessing these records, and it was because Tony worked with him back in the day and knew he would operate in the African coast for black market arms. I know that guy. And back in the day, he operates off the African coast, black market arms. There are conventions, all right? Meet people, I didn't sell him anything. This? Uh, it's a tattoo, I don't think he had it. Where is this guy now? Tony's connections from before he even became Iron Man is what allowed him to track down Claw. Wakanda has spies stationed internationally. We got spies embedded in every nation on Earth. How did they never find out about this upon his escape in the 90s? How did they lose him to begin with on the basis that he triggered a bomb at the border during his escape? All it takes is one person in a Wakandan ship to follow him. What about surveillance drones? Why doesn't Wakanda have those to keep track of escaped prisoners or any threats to the border? They should have already had Claw decades ago. And if they did, this changes the entire plot of this movie, as well as a good portion of Age of Ultron. And it gets even worse during the confrontation with Claw in the South Korea chase. Firstly, the moment Claw enters and starts a ruckus, T'Challa should be suiting up immediately. Yet he decides to fight out of the suit for some reason. He knows that a shootout is possible and could cause civilian casualties, so he needs to be in his best condition to take out the threat as soon as possible. Even when he confronts Claw when he runs out of bullets, he's just standing there, as if the movie paused his character and watched him pull out another weapon and get shot as a result. All he had to do was put his suit on and attack. Seems like a nerf of his reaction time in Civil War. Now the moment the car chase begins, it does some serious damage to T'Challa's character. Right off the bat, why would T'Challa ever bother with staying on top of a car as a means of catching up with Claw? Car chases can be a serious risk of civilian casualties, and he has an easy alternative of using one of his ships to fly over to Claw, then toss one of his car stopping devices onto his car to stop him dead in his tracks. This should be plan A, but it's never even entertained. He decides to chase him by car, which is less efficient and more risky, and Black Panther doesn't even need to use a car. He's shown in Civil War to be capable of catching up to speeding cars, so he's risking all of these lives for no reason. And even when Black Panther finally catches up to one of these cars, he opts to rip it open instead of immediately stopping the car with one of his devices. He even throws off one of the guys who could easily be a potential lead for what Claw is planning or where he could be heading. And if we take a look at this crowded bridge, you'll see that Black Panther is still chasing this other car and hasn't stopped it by throwing his car stopping device. He might as well have asked to shake the driver's hand as a part of a stand-up routine. He even lands on the car soon afterwards with an open opportunity to simply stop the car as he did with the earlier ones in the film. But instead, on this crowded bridge, he decides to use the kinetic energy burst to flip over this car and possibly affect the surrounding area. And this, again, possibly kills off leads he could use to stop Claw. And when he finally reaches Claw's car, he decides to cause this massive car flip that almost smashes into a bunch of people instead of just stopping it with one of his devices. Not only is this damage damaging the Black Panther's character, but this should also get him in trouble with the Accords. So much damage was done during the mission, and this mission wasn't approved by the UN. In order to carry out a plan as a superhero, the UN would have to approve it. You'll operate under the supervision of a United Nations panel only when and if that panel deems it necessary. If the UN panel is supposed to supervise superheroes, then you can't just carry out plans without their approval, especially when you're entering foreign soil. Part of their plan involves using vibranium cars to catch Claw, and involving people who have not even signed the Accords. The world is under the impression that Wakanda is a third world country and had all of its vibranium stolen. Your father told the UN that Claw stole all the vibranium you had. So obviously, the UN wouldn't be in on the fact they were going to use vibranium cars that could be remotely controlled all the way from Wakanda to South Korea. No third world country can do that. For the UN to approve of this plan, they'd have to be in on Wakanda's secrets, which Everett Ross isn't even in on. This wouldn't even be a plan that the UN would think Black Panther is needed for, because this illegal deal could easily be handled through a sting operation, like the one we see in Spider-Man Homecoming. If Claw is just followed discreetly, there's less reason for there to be a shootout. So learning that this was done behind their backs should draw lots of suspicion towards Black Panther. This should be a surprise to the UN, and Black Panther should be facing legal trouble. None of this ever comes up in the film for some reason. 
Killmonger then breaks into the area where Claw is being held captive. Claw gets taken outside and is followed by Black Panther. Then Black Panther gets taken down by an explosion. This seems like another example of nerfing Black Panther from Civil War, because an explosion should not affect him in the suit. It didn't work with Hawkeye's arrows. It didn't work when a truck blew up right next to him. It didn't even work when he was outside the suit at Vienna. Yet here, he just unmasks, stares, and doesn't run after the car. He doesn't even prepare a ship to follow the car. He's just standing there in pause mode when they've been trying to track down Claw for decades, and he has secret information on Wakanda. He slipped through our hands. Slipped. This also ties into how Killmonger plans to get into Wakanda. His plan was to use Claw and eventually kill him to get into Wakanda by showing them the body. But if he just killed Claw during any of their missions by getting the drop on him, or while Claw was in prison, he would have gotten the body anyway, without Claw expecting it or attempting to defend himself. A smart villain would think of this instead of what Killmonger does. He decides to kill him way later, when he needs to kill his guard and Claw, while his girlfriend is in the crossfire of this. Why this of all plans he could have committed to? Why does Killmonger put himself at risk during these heists instead of just killing off Claw as soon as he could and booking it to Wakanda? On top of this, did he even need Claw to get into Wakanda to begin with? You'll just be an outsider. You're crazy to think that you could walk in there. He can literally prove that he is the son of King T'Chaka's brother, show the war dog tattoo, and even show the ring that tipped off T'Challa anyway. He can also blackmail Wakanda and claim that if he isn't given a chance to make his case to the king, he will reveal all of Wakanda's secrets to the internet. That is huge leverage over Wakanda that he just ignored. Later on, we get a reveal of what really happened to T'Challa's uncle back in the 90s. When he was found out to be a traitor to Wakanda and told to face justice for his crimes, he decides to pull out a gun on the spy and he gets killed as a result. But the problem is, he didn't actually need to die. T'Chaka blocked the gunshot very easily, and at that point would have just tossed the gun to the floor. Yet after he already disarmed the guy, he decided to stab his brother, and Killmonger later confirms that he left the panther claws in his chest despite wanting this to be kept secret. I found my daddy with panther claws in his chest. You ain't the son of a king, you are the son of a murderer. And even ignoring that, why can't T'Chaka just have told Wakanda that his brother died because he literally pulled a gun on someone and was killed as a result of defending him? He was planning on informing the public of his crimes anyway, yet he couldn't give this very valid reason as to why he died? He just told a lie that he has no reason to tell. I guess the only damning thing about this is that they left the child behind? As if they couldn't have brought the child over to Wakanda when he's part of his family too? The child also has inside information on Wakanda anyway, shared by his father. Bringing him to Wakanda would avoid the chance that he spreads the word, especially if he ever decides to become a criminal or share this information with criminals, which can easily happen if he literally loses a parental figure that takes care of him. Everett Ross eventually wakes up in Wakanda and he's able to see this entire lab, despite the fact they want to maintain Wakanda's secrecy. He isn't even restrained to his bed. He doesn't even have his eyes covered either, which would completely satisfy Okoye's concerns of the risk of being exposed. And Shuri just lets him walk around and casually answers all of his questions. Okay, is this Wakanda? No, it's Kansas. Bullet wounds don't just magically heal overnight. They do here, but not by magic, by technology. That's magnetic levitation, right? Obviously. The light panels, where are they? Sonic stabilizers. There's vibranium on those trains? There's vibranium all around us. That's how I healed you. Did she just forget Wakanda's strict non-disclosure agreement? If a genius like her slips up so badly, I can only imagine how the kids in Wakanda with internet access would act. Killmonger is eventually brought in to have a disagreement day with T'Challa. He demands the throne and shares his intentions to liberate people who are suffering around the world through vibranium weapons, and reveals what happened the night of his father's death. T'Challa can either deny his request or accept his challenge for the throne. I suppose his guilty conscience on behalf of his father is what causes him to accept the challenge, but the entire country is at stake if he loses, and he has no reason to be super confident that he's going to win this fight after being depowered. He frequently struggles in his other fights knowing he could possibly lose one day, and he knows that this guy is going to wage war against the world if he becomes king. I guess what I'm saying is that the lives of a billion strangers are more important than a fighting competition, and T'Challa would know this. 
If anything, allowing Killmonger the chance to fight him as opposed to detaining him and getting him help will only drag out his vengeful and hateful conduct because now he has a way of physically taking it out on people. From his experiences in Civil War, he would know not to play his game because that will only encourage him to keep letting vengeance consume him. This also risks Killmonger's death in the heat of battle anyway, so he would suffer a fate just like his father did. Why would T'Challa want a repeat of that by playing his game? This is your last chance. Throw down your weapons and we can handle this another way. T'Challa even acknowledges that there are more peaceful ways to resolve this, yet he still entertains Killmonger's game, where he's going to fight out of hatred and vengeance. A kill. Just a idiot. Killed in America. Afghanistan. Iraq. I took life from my own brothers and sisters right here on this continent. So a literal murderer is allowed to compete for the throne? So if Thanos came here and said he wanted to compete for the throne, they just let him do it? The system is making even less sense as we go along. This leads to the death of the spy who was with Killmonger's father, because that's legal too, I guess. At that point, I don't believe a single one of these people close to T'Challa would allow Killmonger to become king, and I don't believe they would stand and watch T'Challa get killed. The biggest source of this problem is Okoye, since the others seem to be on board with coming up with a plan, and the big problem is that they all know that Killmonger is starting war with other countries, and that will expose Wakanda to the public, which Okoye earlier suggested was a major risk to the country. This man is a foreign intelligence operative. How do we justify bringing him into our borders? He it is your duty to protect our. I'm well aware ours. of my duties, General. If Okoye believes it's dangerous to expose Wakanda to the world, and that practice in itself is against Wakandan tradition, then why does she accept Killmonger's plan to wage war against other nations and expose Wakanda worldwide? I am loyal to that throne! No matter who sits upon it. This would result in the fall of Wakanda from her perspective. This isn't something she'd be loyal to. Wakanda has survived for so long by fighting when only absolutely necessary. I also don't understand Killmonger's plan in actually starting war with other nations. Instead of being subtle about his intentions, perhaps suggesting better changes to the system as he slowly positions them towards war until they're all prepared, he decided to immediately reveal that he wants to use Vibranium to wage war against other countries and make sure that everyone around him knows. Yet preparing to conquer other nations would take plenty of planning, which means plenty of time. While he's planning his attacks, any random bystander can alert other nations of what's happening as a warning since there's no chance of their own government stopping Killmonger. Word could possibly get out to the Avengers, especially if T'Challa's family wants to involve other parties to defeat Killmonger since the Wakandan military is following him. What's Killmonger's plan if Thor breaks into Wakanda and throws a barrage of lightning at his troops before he's even finalized a plan of attack? What if T'Challa's family got Iron Man's attention and he decided to get the drop on the Wakandan military? This is why you don't tell the nation what you're doing before you've even prepared to do it. We're gonna send vibranium weapons out to our war dog. They'll arm oppressed people all over the world so they can finally rise up and kill those in power. This should have been done discreetly before revealing to the nation what he was planning to do, because if the Avengers or the governments know what you're up to before you've even performed these time-consuming tasks, then it's game over. Speaking of which, why don't any of T'Challa's family members attempt to reach out to the Avengers that T'Challa had connections with? Why did Killmonger even let them go, knowing what they could do to get the word out? And how did T'Challa survive that huge fall despite the fact he lost his powers and was already bleeding out from the fight with Killmonger? Killmonger apparently stole one of Black Panther's suits, which Shuri didn't put under lock and key for some reason. By default, you shouldn't be able to just grab a necklace and be able to wear the Black Panther suit. This should require a passcode or only be coded to the king. Even Iron Man 3 thought of this. And why is it that all of the security in Shuri's lab just left? Shouldn't Killmonger account for the fact she could return there and use her tech to fight back? She can use this to access a ship that's more than dangerous enough for Killmonger. You can wipe out an entire group of troops with that. And even though the Dora Milaje spears are stated to function as cannons as well, they just run up to the enemies instead of shooting from a distance, making their jobs way harder for themselves. And as the fight goes on, T'Challa finds a way to outsmart Killmonger and defeat him. But in doing so, he ended up stabbing Killmonger. Now as I recall, the film shows us that there are medical tools that they have access to that can treat wounds prior to sending someone to the ER. T'Challa has a chance to save Killmonger's life instead of letting him suffer the same fate as his father. Yet he doesn't do that straight away. He takes him on an elevator just to watch the sunset and even acknowledges later that he could save his life. Maybe we can still heal you. 
Why didn't T'Challa do that from the start then? He basically let Killmonger die for no reason, which really conflicts with his criticism towards his father for not trying to make a better life for Killmonger in spite of the circumstances. That's pretty much all I have to say about the plot. I've already talked about a lot of character issues with Black Panther himself, but I think there is one that really damages this film in a uniquely significant way. Black Panther needed an entire film to progress to a point where he no longer stays in the shadows and starts to question his legacy and start helping the rest of the world. I brought this up earlier as a problem for how his father is handled, but it's also a problem for Black Panther. Nakia states that she wants Wakanda to do more with their resources, which is exactly what King T'Chaka said in Civil War right before he died. His last word were about wanting to commit to helping the world with the resources they have. T'Challa's father is his main inspiration, especially when it comes to being the Black Panther and being a leader. What Nakia says to him shouldn't be a new idea to him. His father supported this since Age of Ultron, a year before Civil War, and it's bizarre that Nakia didn't even bring this up. Furthermore, the vibranium weapon created by Ultron nearly destroyed the entire world, and it may not have happened with the help of Wakanda, which is what made his father interested in helping the rest of the world with their resources. This is somehow ignored by T'Challa in favor of an arc that he really shouldn't have to go through by this point. What made T'Challa ignore his father's wishes for Wakanda compared to what happens in this film? How does the entire world nearly dying because of their use of vibranium not convince him to step out of the shadows and help others, but Killmonger's tragic backstory does? It feels like Civil War was setting up something promising, but this film wanted to aim for a different direction, so different that it contradicts what we see in Civil War, to the point of destroying major characters in that story. This movie needed lots of work in the writing department. Many of its ideas absolutely had potential, and there is interesting material in the film to work with, but the execution needed additional redrafting in order for it to fit within the universe they're trying to build on, and make for more consistent character writing overall. Outside of these problems, there are fun elements of the movie to appreciate, and the acting is strong overall. If you disagree with anything, feel free to come on Disagreement Day, which is hosted every week or so on a livestream. That's all I got for now. Let me know what you want me to review next. Goodbye.